Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Biostatistics for Non-Statisticians, Understanding Different Types of Analyses and When to Use Each. My name is Melanie Ciotti. I am our marketing strategist here at SDC, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker for today, I'm going to cover a few basic webinar housekeeping tips. First, everyone has two audio options for listening in on today's webinar, computer audio or phone. If you hear any interference, either over the phone or through your computer, the best way to troubleshoot that is to simply switch to the alternate audio option. If technical issues persist, please know that we are recording today's webinar and we will be sharing that recording with all registrants via email tomorrow, Friday. So please keep an eye out for that link in your inbox. We encourage you to share the recording with your friends, colleagues, and anyone who you feel would benefit from this webinar. You may have noticed that the audience is on mute by default. If you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, we do encourage you to communicate that with us using the question section in the webinar portal. If your question or comment references a specific slide, please include the slide number in your message so we know where to go back to. At the end of the presentation, we should have about 10, maybe 15 minutes available for Q&A. We have a lot of attendees joining us today, so if we are not able to cover all of the questions that you submitted, we will do our best to follow up individually via email as time permits. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Dale W. Usner, PhD, Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Vice President of Strategic Scientific Consulting at SDC. Dale has over 25 years of experience in the clinical trials industry. Most notably, he has significant experience supporting over 100 regulatory body interactions with the FDA, PMDA, EMA, advisory committee meetings, pretty much you name it, he's done it. He also specializes in study design and clinical program development support. He maintains an array of therapeutic area experience with deep expertise in oncology, ophthalmology, gastrointestinal, neurology, and antiviral anti-infective. Dale holds a PhD in statistics from Oregon State University, as well as a master's in statistics and a bachelor's in mathematics from other esteemed universities. I personally have worked with Dale for the last six years here at SDC. And what I look up to most in him is his ability to explain statistical concepts to people across all levels of understanding, from very senior level statisticians to those of us who may have taken an intro to statistics class back in high school or college. This webinar in particular is tailored to non-statistician clinical trial professionals. So if you're watching this, you probably fall somewhere within that spectrum. I want to thank you again for tuning in to today's webinar. Remember, if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please share those with us using the question section of your webinar portal. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce and pass things over to Dr. Dale Usner with his presentation, Biostatistics for Non-Statisticians, Understanding Different Types of Analyses and When to Use Each. Thank you very much, Mel, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening um, to everybody online. Thank you uh, for joining this webinar and my presentation today. My presentation um, will walk through the following as a, as a top-line agenda. First, I will walk through introduction to terminology and types of data. I will then walk through and illustrate with examples t-tests analysis of covariance, Wilcox and rank sum test, Pearson chi-square test and logistic regression, log rank test, and hazard ratios, and then I will summarize with key takeaways. One thing that you will notice during this presentation is the first couple of topics will take um, quite a bit of time as I develop an underlying understanding uh, for which you will see will be re-shown throughout the rest of today's agenda. So first, an introduction to terminology and, and types of data. So the general objective of a pivotal clinical trial is to demonstrate that a test therapeutic product is safe and effective in the population of interest. And I want to make that very clear. It's in the population of interest. 
generally, we are unable to treat and measure the entire population. It's just, it's too costly. So, for example, let's say we want to um, treat and measure the entire population of type 2 diabetes patients in the U.S. alone. Just to identify all the patients um, would take an enormous amount of effort as well as then the cost and time uh, to treat and measure all of those patients. And therefore, in clinical trials, what we do instead is we take a sample of subjects from that population, treat them, measure them, and use statistical inference to determine the safety and efficacy on the population as a whole. So efficacy and safety in, in clinical trials, uh, efficacy can be broken down really in, into a, a couple of key uh, groups. First one is superiority to control, where we're attempting to show that the test product is better than either a placebo or a currently marketed active. Another efficacy scenario is non-inferiority to active control. So you're trying to show that you're not worse to something already marketed. And finally, equivalence to a reference. This is generally used uh, when we're talking about generics. Safety component of a clinical trial, really you're just looking at the overall safety profile of the test product. Um, and that safety profile being adverse events, vital signs, hematology, blood chemistries, electrocardiogram, et cetera. Every now and then you will also see a study that actually has as one of its primary endpoints a superiority for safety, where you're basically trying to show that this new test product has a, a better safety profile than something that is currently marketed and, and would then have possibly similar efficacy. Our focus today though is going to, uh, throughout is going to be on efficacy and without loss of generality, we're going to look at the scenario where we're demonstrating superiority to a control. Now, statistical inference, you know, from the sample to the population, if you would, is completed through testing hypotheses. So a standard superiority hypothesis uh, would be as follows. The null hypothesis, or h naught, this the first hypothesis that you see here. Um, this is considered the null hypothesis. I will also most likely say H naught throughout. Um, and the, the null hypothesis here is that the parameter of interest for the primary endpoint is the same for test and control. I've kept that very generic and, and we'll get more specific as we go along versus the alternative hypothesis that the parameter of interest for the primary endpoint is different for test and control. Hypotheses are conjectures around the population parameters. Again, we can't test the whole population, but that's what we're looking to draw inference to is the whole population. Testing of the hypotheses are completed using statistics that are created from the sample that we are able to treat and measure. One term that I'm gonna use throughout here today is test statistic. The test statistic is a statistic that is used to determine whether or not we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. In general, what the test statistic is doing, regardless of what type of statistic, is it's comparing the value that you actually see in the trial, that observed value that you see in the trial, to what you would expect under the null hypothesis. So if I'm expecting under the null hypothesis that the parameter of interest is the same for test and control, then if I'm seeing an observed value that shows that they're quite different, that, sh that is basically leading me to believe that, okay, the H naught is not true. I'm going to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Now, this comparison always has to be done accounting for the variability of the sample statistic. From the sample, from the test statistic, we obtain a p-value. And the p-value is what most people are comfortable with, that's what, or at least what they frequently see, maybe not comfortable with, but it's a, a, a number that is very frequently um, discussed um, and presented uh, at the end of a clinical trial. And the p-value is the probability of observing a statistic as or more extreme than the one observed, assuming H naught is true. So let's say again that, you know, here in our generic H naught, we say that test and control are not different. Um, so therefore a difference in means would be considered to be zero. 
So if I'm seeing an observed difference of means that say is, let's say is 20 units, whatever that unit is, that 20 units could be pretty far away from zero, but that depends on the variability um, of the measure. And I will get into that variability right now. In general, pivotal trials require that a two-sided p-value is less than 0 0.05 in order to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Um, now that can be argued, and, and uh, uh, that's a, a little deeper than um, what this presentation is going to go into, but I will use that level throughout the, the presentation. Now, the next step in a clinical trial is really designing what those hypotheses are and designing what the tests are. And in order to do that, we need to understand the type of data collected. So I'm going to walk through three types of data that, um, in general, can be collected in a clinical trial. The first is qualitative or nominal. These measures don't have a quantitative value. Uh, they're generally labels or names. So for instance, as an example, race being Caucasian, Black or African American, Asian, or gender, male, female. The other component of a qualitative or nominal variable is that there's no inherent order. Um, one can't order males or females. One can't order you know, a, a Caucasian, Black or African American, or Asian. So for this type of data, what summaries are standardly used? What one would frequently see in, in statistical tables or presentations of this data is frequency counts and percentages. The next type of data that I'll walk through quickly is quantitative, and I'm going to walk through two types of quantitative data. The first is ordinal, where the measures have an order, however, differences between each level are unknown or not appropriately measured, if you would. So take, for example, adverse event grade. Adverse events are graded frequently mild, moderate, or severe. They're, they can be given a numeric component of one, two, or three. But is the difference between severe and moderate a unit of one? Is that really the same as the difference between moderate and mild? Um, I don't think anybody would argue that there's a one unit difference between each of those. And that's what's meant regarding the differences between each level are unknown. However, one would argue that they are ordered. Moderate is worse than mild, severe is worse than moderate, so there is an inherent order. Other examples would be a satisfaction scale as, as seen here. The summaries that are used for this type of data would be frequency counts and percentages, and specifically if the number of categories in the scale is small, let's say five or less. Means and standard deviations or medians are also used, and they're used more frequently when the number of categories in a scale are more, um, let's say, greater than five. And finally, the last type of, of data that I will be going through is quantitative, and this is, can be called interval or ratio. You usually just hear it uh, described as being continuous. These measures both have an order and an exact difference between levels. So systolic blood pressure, if you have one, uh, 120 millimeters of mercury versus 110, there is 10 millimeters of mercury different uh, between those two, and 120 is higher than 110. Um, many blood chemistry and hematology lab values are also continuous. Timing of events of interest are, are continuous as well. Um, summaries for continuous measures are uh, really means and standard deviations as well as medians. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a couple of examples of analysis techniques illustrated by an example. Um, and the first is going to be t-test and analysis of covariance, uh, assuming continuous or quantitative data. So let's consider a new study of a diabetic medication to lower blood glucose. Uh, the units are going to be milligram per deciliter. Units are important. That's the last time you're going to see them here today just for, for space issues, but uh, understand it's milligrams per deciliter. Uh, the efficacy measure is blood glucose at day 90, and we want to demonstrate superiority in efficacy versus an improved control. What's the parameter of choice here to determine whether test is more effective than control? Assuming a bell-shaped distribution, or normal or Gaussian distribution as it's also called, most frequently the parameter of interest is chosen to be the mean. And hypotheses would be constructed as seen below. The null hypothesis being that the mean blood glucose value at day 90 is the same for test and control, and the alternative being that they're different for test and control. 
What can also possibly think of a situation where you might be interested in showing that actually, you know what, my test product, while it doesn't improve the mean, it does improve the variability. So it, one could have hypotheses like this where we say the population standard deviation is the same for test and control versus the population standard deviation is different for test and control. That's very rare to see, um, and uh, standard deviation usually just comes along for the ride, but in certain cases it is a parameter of interest. So to further consider this example, again, since we can't treat and measure the entire population, we can only treat and measure a sample. I'm going to consider that the population day 90, the, the population mean for the day 90 blood glucose is 102 in the test arm and 105 in the control arm. Both have a standard deviation of 10.6. Now, measuring a sample from the population, the mean has variability. If I'm going to sample just 10 subjects and calculate a mean, if I do that 20 different times, I'm going to come up with 20 different means because I'm only sampling 10 subjects. So what's really key for the rest of this presentation is understanding that the mean has variability, and it's because you can choose different samples. If we have a total population that is 100,000 people and I'm only choosing a sample size of 10, I can choose so many different samples, I'm going to get different means every time. Those means have a distribution, and I will exhibit what the distribution is um, in the next couple of slides. The, the variability of the distribution of the mean is dependent both on the overall variability of the observations as a whole, so from subject to subject, as well as on the size of the sample. So one can imagine that the larger your sample, the smaller your variability because you're including more and more people in that sample. So in these next slides, what I'm going to go over is the distribution of sample means for sample sizes of 1, 10, 50, and 100. So I'm going to start off with a sample size of 1, and it's in the same the scenario that I just laid out uh, with a test mean of 102, control mean of 105, uh, with a standard deviation of 10.6. Now the x-axis here is the blood glucose value. The y-axis is essentially the number of times the mean was within the range of, of the x-axis categories. The blue bars denote the test distribution. The orange bars denote the control distribution. The purple bars are where those two overlap. So you can see that with an N of 1, the range of values for both the test and control are fairly significant. They would range from below 60 up to above 140, and there's a substantial overlap between the two distributions, the standard deviation being 10.6. Now, if I move forward and, and show the exact same figure on the exact same axes, but with a mean of 10 subjects, so I'm looking at the distribution of mean of 10 subjects, what you can see is that the spread of data has reduced drastically. There, it's much narrower, the possible values of the mean of 10, than it was for a mean of 1. The standard deviation dropped from 10.6 to 3.3. Also, what you can see is that there's more blue showing and more orange showing, less purple. So there's less overlap in those two distributions. So you're starting to be able to differentiate the two distributions by taking a mean of 10. When we go up to 50, you're seeing the exact same thing continue to happen. Again, the means are still 102 and 105. The standard deviations have now dropped from 3.3 to 1.5, and that's incredibly visible by looking at the range of values now that a mean of n of 50 can take on. The test distribution being in blue, you can substantially differentiate that um, from the control distribution in orange, and there's very little overlap in purple. And then finally, for an n of 100, the same thing just continues to happen where the, the total possible values continues to shrink and narrow, and the test arm and the control arm continue to become increasingly differentiatable with less overlap in the purple. So what I wanted to exhibit there is the basic concept that the higher the sample size, the easier it will be to differentiate two populations of means um, and the, the test statistic from the samples of those populations. 
And essentially what one wants to understand there, and that's we can get so large, so I could end up having a sample size, let's say, of a thousand. And with a sample size of a thousand in each arm, I might be able to show statistical significance in a difference that's not clinically meaningful. So there's always a balance here for both having a sample size that is so large that I might be able to show a difference that's not meaningful versus having enough sample size to be able to demonstrate a difference that is meaningful. So statistical inference, again, I, the statistical inference is all about making a um, determination of whether or not to uh, reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis using a sample of, of patients. As I stated before, a general component of a test statistic is you're comparing the observed value versus what one might expect under the null distribution or under the null hypothesis, accounting for the variability of the uh, difference. So in this case, very specifically, where I'm looking at a null hypothesis that is that the means are the same between the two groups versus an alternative where the means are different, my t-test statistic is, is going to be comprised of the observed difference in means minus what one would expect under H0 divided by the variability. Here, what would one expect under the null hypothesis? Well, the null hypothesis is that the, the means are the same. So the expected difference under the null hypothesis would be zero. And so I plugged in zero um, within this test statistic. The other thing to see here is that the variability of the test statistic that I just got done demonstrating by showing you that as I increase the sample size, that variability decreases. Um, I just showed that with the histograms. So that can be seen here in this component of the test statistic where I am multiplying the standard deviation times two. Two is purely from the fact that there are two treatment groups divided by the n per treatment group. And so the larger that n is, the smaller this whole value is that I'm multiplying by the standard deviation. So the whole denominator becomes smaller, um, which is basically saying that the variability of the test statistic is, or of the sample statistic is smaller, which makes the test statistic larger. Why does that matter? The higher the magnitude of the test statistic, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, what matters is the absolute value. So the higher the magnitude of the test statistic, the lower the p-value is going to be. And so that's why that matters, and that's why people are always looking at, that, at the sample size. Today, though, I'm more interested in that standard deviation. How can I drive a test statistic up, not by increasing sample size, but by decreasing standard deviation? So that's what a, a key component of today will be about. So consider the following observed outcomes from a trial um, of, a di of this diabetes medication, um, where I have a sample size of 50 within each treatment group. The observed day 90 values are as follows. What you see here on the horizontal axis is just uh, used to, dis to display the test arm and the control arm. The spread on the horizontal axis does not mean anything. The only reason there is a spread here is so that we can see all the points. So it's artificially created so that I can see all the observations. So please don't interpret anything with respect to the, the spread on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the day 90 results. So what we can see here from this sample of 50 in each treatment group, I have a mean of 99.3 in the test arm and a mean of 103.1 in the control arm. Now compare that, the population mean was 102. So this is pretty different from the, the assumed population mean, and this is pretty different from the assumed population mean, which was 105. So they're both different than the assumed population mean, and that's because an N of 50 um, isn't that large. And so there's still quite some variability that one could have around the means. Now, the standard deviation, if you remember, the assumed standard deviation was 10.6. I'm seeing a standard deviation of 10.4 for the test arm and 12.3 for the control arm. The difference in means here is negative 3.9. What would you conclude from this data? Would you conclude, based off of the amount of overlap that you're seeing between the test and the control, um, and basically by overlap, what I'm saying is that the test data, you know, the range of test data is from here to here, the range of control data is from here to here, 
there's quite a bit of vertical overlap between the test and the control data. So is it conclusive? Does this demonstrate that there is a difference um, in those means enough to reject the null hypothesis that there isn't a difference? The way we determine that is we create the t-statistic that we had just gone over. Um, so statistical inference using the t-statistic. So what we went over before, I placed in the difference in means, negative 3.9, which is the observed. I'm subtracting off that, which is expected, which is zero under the null, they're the same. And I'm dividing by the standard error of, of the difference in means as, as discussed. Now here, the 11.4 is really just a combination of the 10.4 and 12.3 that we showed on the previous page for test and control. So it's, it's not quite an average, but it, it's close to an average, and that's why I use the term combined. In this case, the test statistic is negative 1.70. This leads to a p-value of 0 0.0927, not significant. Smaller than I would have thought, given the picture on the other on the previous slide. However, it does not meet that uh, two-sided 0.05 level that we discussed earlier is required um, to reject a null in a pivotal trial. So the next thing people might want to do is, well, hold on, let's take a look at the change from baseline. Maybe there was a difference in baseline and the change from baseline, or uh, maybe we can get some variance reduction in the change from baseline. Uh, let's see if, if we look at the change from baseline, if there's a difference. So the, change, the mean change from baseline for the test arm for this data was negative 58.5 with a standard deviation of 11.8. The mean for the control was 53.5 with a standard deviation of 15.4. So the difference was negative five. So the, the magnitude of the difference actually increased, which is good. It was 3.9 before, it's now 5.0. That's good because that's gonna drive the test statistic higher. And again, it's because it's relative to what one would expect, zero. Is five further away from zero than 3.9? The answer, sadly, is it depends. And it depends on the variance, the denominator. Here, the denominator increased slightly because the variability was a, a slightly higher at 13.7 versus 11.4. So overall, there was an increase in the magnitude of the test statistic to negative 1.81 from negative 1.7, but still not significant at the 0.05 level with a 0.0736. So what, what techniques can we further implement to reduce the variance of this mean? We're at the end of a study I don't want to increase the sample size, or perhaps I have created a sample size looking at it in this way that I'm not able to actually afford. The cost is too great. What can I do? What techniques can I use that I might be able to reduce that variability so that I can either show significance or that I can have better power, if you would, for less sample size? One way to go about that is an analysis of covariance. And so what is an analysis of covariance? An analysis of covariance is you're, an, you're still trying to determine the difference between test and control in the day 90 value for blood glucose, but you're accounting for or you're adjusting for some baseline characteristics. In this case, I'm going to adjust for the baseline glucose level. So on this figure, it's the exact same observations that I've been showing previously. However, in this figure, I've got day 90 still on the vertical axis, I have the baseline blood glucose on the horizontal axis. The red dots are the, are the control observations. The black circles are the test observations. The red line is the linear regression line that's fit through least squares for the, the control arm, and the black line is the linear regression fit for the test arm. And so what one can see here that was a little bit more difficult to see um, on the prior figure is that there is a bit of separation. You can generally tell that the red dots are higher vertically than the black dots when you're adjusting for baseline. So what, when does it make a difference to adjust for baseline and why will it matter here? I haven't shown that it does, but why will it? The reason it's going to matter is because there's a, a good correlation, if you would, between the baseline value and day 90. And by that I mean, the higher your baseline value is, the higher your day 90 value is. And that can be expected. So essentially when that occurs is if the, the medications or the therapies that are given are going, to be re, are going to reduce the baseline value by a set amount. 
So in this case, it's reducing the baseline values by a set amount or, you know, in the high 50s. Um, and so the higher, again, your baseline, the higher your day 90. So when one completes an analysis of covariance, frequently an endpoint or a summary that is given is the LS mean. And the LS mean is something that most people don't quite understand um, how that's calculated, what it is. So this next slide, again, using the exact same data points, I'm gonna illustrate the calculation of the LS mean. And to calculate the LS mean, essentially what you do is you determine the overall average baseline value after pooling both the test arm and the control arm for baseline. This is at baseline, it's pre-treatment, um, and so it's, it's, it's okay, and actually it's, it, one should pull the data together. So we pull the data together, we get an overall baseline mean of 157.2. So then to calculate what's called the LS mean, which stands for least squares mean, you draw a, a vertical line up until you hit each of the regression lines for test and control. And then once you hit the line, you draw a horizontal line over to the y-axis and determine the value. And that is the LS mean. So it's essentially the predicted value for the test and control at the, at the predicted day 90 value at the average baseline value. That's all the LS mean is. What's neat here is that this LS means of 90 and 103.4 are pretty similar to the overall mean. If you remember, the overall mean for test was 99.3, not accounting for baseline, and was 103.1 for control, not accounting for baseline. So very similar to um, what the, the overall means were. So let's jump forward. All right, we've taken a look at, briefly um, in, in graphical form what is meant by an analysis of covariance or adjusting for baseline um, and LS means. So let's take a look at the, the test statistic from this. So the LS means, as I just said, were 90.0 um, for test and 103.4 for control. This ends up with a mean difference of negative 4.4. This mean difference um, should be comforting because the mean difference, if I jump down here, for day 90 by itself was negative 3.9. The mean difference for the change from baseline was negative 5.0. So this, this mean difference of the LS means is right in between those two. So that's very comforting. We're not getting some outlandish value. It's, it's, it's right in between um, those two values. The test statistic, um, again, we have the same square root um, here of, of two because we have two treatment groups and 50 subjects per treatment group but the standard deviation is quite a bit smaller at 5.9. Whereas if you remember previously for the day 90, it was 11.4 and for the change from baseline, it was 13.7. So this test statistic increases in magnitude greatly to negative 3.72, which results in a p-value of 0 0.0003. So I've now just looked at the same data three different ways, day 90 change from baseline to day 90 and adjusting for baseline. Change from baseline and adjusting for baseline are two different things. One, in this case, resulted in a p-value of 0 0.0736. The other resulted in a p-value of 0 0.0003. And one, when one takes a look at that p-value and compares it to what is required to reject the, the null hypothesis in a pivotal trial of 0 0.05, this fails to reject. This does not fail to reject. And, and we would reject the null hypothesis here and conclude that the mean day 90 blood glucose level for the test is lower than for control. So how did we do this? How did we drop the standard deviation so much here? Let's take a look at standard deviation. So this is a busy plot, so forgive me on this. Hopefully it's meaningful by the time I finish discussing it. What you see here are the, the same observations that I have discussed heretofore, as well as the same regression lines. Let me get my little pointer back. Uh, so the same regression lines, but what I've added are these two horizontal dashed lines. These two horizontal dashed lines are the overall mean, not adjusting for baseline. So this is the overall mean for control was 103.1, and the overall mean for test was 99.3. So those are basically just showing the overall means. I'm going to walk over here to these dashed brackets that are created, and what these dashed brackets are doing are showing the spread of the data at day 90. And so the spread of the data for control is slightly larger than the spread of data for test, 
And the way the standard deviation is calculated uh, when one does when one does not adjust. So the standard deviation, if you remember, of uh, 10.4 and I think 12.6 or something very close to that. Forgive me um, for the for the test and the control. It's calculated by looking at the distance between each observed value and the estimated value. And my straight line drawing skills are not so great. There we go. So it's taking a look at that distance for all the points and averaging it up. That's the standard deviation. The same for, if you would, the test. So you take a look at all those distances to the overall mean and you average them. That's the standard deviation. So those are the values that we were getting um, above 10. Now, the standard deviation for after adjusting for baseline was 5.9. How is that calculated? So if you see here, I've got these two solid square brackets. And these solid square brackets are demonstrating the distribution of points around the regression line. And so the standard deviation that is calculated after adjusting for baseline, instead of looking at the distances that we see here, we're instead calculating the standard deviation by taking an average of the distances from each point to the regression line. So those are all far smaller. Let's see here. Those distances are all far smaller to the regression line than to the overall mean. And that is how the standard deviation went from 10, 11, 12, down to 5.9. Because now I'm looking at the variability around the regression lines. I am not looking at the variability around the overall means. So that is, that is the, the reason um, why one is able to demonstrate a statistical significance um, using an adjustment for baseline. That's also the reason that sometimes regulatory bodies aren't comfortable adjusting for baseline because I've just reduced the variance so much, I might be able to show a statistically significant difference for a difference that's not clinically meaningful. And so there is concern that you're reducing the variability too much sometimes and you're no longer demonstrating a meaningful difference. So now we're going on into the Wilcoxon rank sum. So the reason I'm discussing Wilcoxon rank sum is it's one of the most, if not the most misinterpreted tests um, that I have seen. And so on the Wilcoxon rank sum, it's also called the Man Whitney U test. This is a non parametric test. Um, it, it is used for continuous or ordinal data. Um, there's no requirement for normally distributed or bell shaped data. Uh, it's used to compare quantitative, as I just said, the continuous or ordinal measures between treatment groups when normality is questionable. And the creation of the Wilcoxon rank sum test statistic is, goes as follows. First, you combine all the data, at, let's say at day 90, and you rank the observations from lowest to highest. You then assign each observation their, their rank as a score. And then you sum those scores within each treatment group. And under the null hypothesis, that score will have a, a specific value because under the null where they're the same, you're going to expect that half, you know, that essentially they're evenly distributed throughout that rank order. And so you can come up with an expected total sum of scores. So you compare that expected total scum sum with the observed sum of scores. And that is the Wilcoxon rank sum test. Now consider the following, median blood glucose. I changed this, the scenario slightly here where I have a sample size of 200 in each group. And my median for test is 98.8 and my median for control is 98.5. Again, this is day 90 blood glucose values. The two-sided Wilcoxon rank sum p-value is 0 0.0312. Excellent. It's less than 0 0.05. I am able to safely reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative and conclude that test is different than control. Hold on. Here, the median test is 98.8. It's actually higher than control. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a product that has better reduction in blood glucose. So in this instance, while it's significant, these medians show that the test median is higher than the control. 
is the appropriate conclusion of this p-value that these medians are different? That is what frequent, that is the frequent interpretation of the Wilcoxon rank sum p-value, that the medians are different. So let's, let's figure out if that's really what this is saying. I've added some additional statistics here, the exact same data. The test mean is 97.0, the control mean is 99.5. So the test mean is lower than the control mean. The median was higher for the test and the control. Hold on, the, the two-sided T statistic is negative 4.27 with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So now I've got an interpretation of the T statistic that's saying the mean is statistically significantly lower for the test group than the control group, but with the Wilcoxon rank sum, am I saying that the median is statistically significantly higher? How, are, how do we discuss this? How do we move forward? What, you know, what can we do? What is our conclusion um, to these two seemingly competing results? The answer comes in that the Wilcoxon rank sum test is not testing a difference in medians. So I think that just needs to be removed um, from people's thoughts. It's actually testing a difference in the distributions of the data. Um, and that was really by creation as, um, as discussed earlier. So here's the data in a histogram form. So the exact same layout as my other histograms. Um, and the key thing that you can see in this histogram is that the blue, the test arm, which is blue, is long tailed to the left. So there's a lot of lower values in the test arm, a lot of higher values in the control arm. So the test arm is called left skewed, the control arm is called right skewed. That's what the Wilcoxon rank sum te uh, test is picking up. Not that the medians are different, but that those distributions are different. Now to, to show that in yet one more fashion, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the control arm and I'm just gonna flip it so that it is also left skewed instead of right skewed. That can be seen in this slide. So again, all I did was I flipped the control arm so that it's skewed the same way as, as the test arm. Let's take a look at the data. We get the exact same medians, test median 98.8, control median 98.5. Now the rank sum p-value is 0 0.3505. It is not showing significance. And all I did was I flipped that distribution. So when it was significant, it was, it was telling you that the distributions are different. It's not telling you that the medians are different. So a lot of time on the Wilcoxon rank sum, you really need to take a look at the data a little bit more and not boil it down to that single uh, statistic of the median. Okay, so my next example that I'm going to go through is, is an example where I'm going to look at responder analysis in the exact same illustration of the blood glucose level uh, for this test and control. So again here, I'm using the exact same data. I've got 50 test patients and 50 control patients. Um, I haven't filled in the actual cell values here. Uh, my responder I'm defining as those with blood glucose less than 95 at day 90, and a non-responder is anybody that's greater than or equal to 95 at day 90. Here, H0 is the population proportion of responders at day 90 is the same for test and control, versus the alternative being that the proportion of responders at day 90 is different for test and control. So one thing that we have to do for a test statistic is determine what is our expected values, right? So a test statistic is the observed value of the observed statistic, if you would, minus the expected or uh, in comparison or here minus the expected value under the null distribution. So one of the things we want to do right off the bat is, okay, if I have 50 test subjects and 50 control subjects and I know that I have 32 responders, how many of those should be in the test arm and how many of those should be in the control arm under the null hypothesis? Well, under the null hypothesis, um, test is the same as control. So one would expect that since half of the subjects, 50 over 100, are test and half of the subjects are control, one would expect half of the responders to be in test and control. And the same for non-responders. And so indeed, um, I've shown calculations here, but that's exactly what is done here. This 50 over 100 is just saying, all right, my proportion of the total subjects that are in the test arm is a half. I'm multiplying half by the total number of responders. So my expected number of responders under the null hypothesis is 16 for the test arm and 16 for the control arm. And the same for the non-responders at 34 and 34. 
These percentages of 32% for responders is just 16 over 50. This is a typical value that one might see, and it's just showing 32% of test arm treatments respond, 32% of control arm uh, treat, uh, subjects respond. And again, this is what one would expect under the null. This is needed to construct the statistic. So now consider that the observed data is actually 19 instead of 13. So instead of what we're, we were seeing here originally is 32, 32, it's actually 38% and 26%. The marginals are all the same. Are these values significantly different from expected, assuming the null, the, the no treatment effect? How do we test that? Again, back to the test statistic. We're looking at what was observed, how it compares to what would, one would expect under the null, divided by some value for the variability. What you see here is that um, what I just discussed, it's a very similar con test statistic construction. What you see in the cells is indeed the test statistic being constructed for each cell. So observed, we saw 19, we would expect 16. We're squaring it because we don't want negative values. So down here we would have a negative value. Um, instead of doing an absolute value uh, uh, in statistics frequently, we'll square something uh, just because it has better mathematical properties. And what we're going to divide by is the expected value. And the expected value, again, is a way to, is a measurement here of the variability. And so observed minus expected divided by the variability, and we get 0.563 for each of the responder cells and 0.265 for each of the non-responder cells. The Pearson chi-square statistic is purely just the sum of these cells sum of observed minus expected squared over expected. So that becomes 1.654, and this yields a p-value of 0.1984. So not something that is statistically significant. So um, because this is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject H0, um, and we conclude that the values, the proportion of responders, are uh, essentially the same, if you would. We, we can't um, show that they're not the same between test and control. Okay, so previously when we looked at means and we saw a p-value that wasn't significant, what did we do? We looked at a way to reduce variance. One way to reduce variance would be to increase the sample size. It always is. The other way to reduce variance is to adjust for baseline or some baseline characteristics. So what I'm going to look at now is logistic regression, adjusting for baseline. And so what you see here is Essentially, the x-axis, again, is the baseline value. Here I've had to categorize, because I'm looking at proportions of responders, I'm having to group subjects together. And so what I've done is I've grouped any subject in the test arm or control arm separately. Any subject that had a baseline value less than 20 are grouped together. Subjects that had values between 120 and 140 are grouped together. Subjects that had values between 140 and 160 are grouped together, and, and so on. The, the vertical axis is the proportion of response at, at day 90. And so the, the dashed lines are the overall observed proportions of response that we had just seen of, of 0.38 and 0.26. So that's um, just right here. So I've just drawn horizontal lines at the overall uh, proportion of responders not accounting for baseline. And so what the points are, are the proportion of responders in the group of subjects within the baseline value category. And the numbers next to the points show you the number of subjects in that category. So let me take this as an example. There were eight test subjects between that had a baseline scores between 120 and 140. All eight of them showed a response. There were 12 control subjects between 120 and 140, and only about 70-ish percent of those had a response. The same thing here down for subjects with baseline values between 140 and 160, 21 of them in the test arm and about 50% had a response, 15 in the control arm and about 10% had a response. These solid lines that you see are the regression for a binary variable. It's basically logistic regression. And the reason it's curved is because of the way the data needs to be fit. Um, and one thing that you want to see here, though, is that the test um, the predicted value, if you would, or the model value for test is higher 
than that for control. So the black line, if you would, is above the red line, and, and significantly so, except at the tails. And one would expect, you know, it, it, hopefully it makes sense to everybody, if you have a baseline value above 160, it's going to be harder to have a day 90 value less than 95 than if you, you know, because if I'm starting at 180 and I have to go down to 95, I have to drop 85 points. If I'm starting at 120 and I have to go down to below 95, I'm only having to drop 25 points. So it's much more difficult to have a response up here in the higher baseline than in the lower baseline, and that's exactly what this is showing. Moreover, the other component of this, and please understand, when I walk through the construction of the standard deviation, um, the exact same thing can be looked at here. You know, if I'm looking at the variance to the overall mean, or the overall proportion, I'm looking from here to here. But if I'm looking at the variance for the logistic regression, essentially I'm only looking from here to here. So again, so the overall variance, not just looking to date proportion to day 90 is going from here to here. I'm looking at that distance, but the distance, you know, for looking to, for the analysis adjusting for baseline is actually only looking from that dot down to the line. So there's a much less of a distance between each point and this modeled line than between each point and the overall proportion line. And so that also reduces the variance substantially. And so in this case, what happens? Logistic regression adjusting for baseline. So um, what we saw for the overall Pearson chi-square, again, I'm comparing the 38% to 26%. The p-value was 9, uh, 0 0.1984. After adjusting for baseline, that p-value drops to 0 0.0108, so a significant reduction um, in that p-value, and we're now able to reject the null in favor of the alternative, saying that the proportion of responders is higher in the test arm than the control arm. The LS means, the exact same construction for the LS means can happen here. It's 22.7 for the test and 4.4 for the control, and the way I would do that is just walking back here, again, it was around 157, so I'm going to say that's close enough. And I go up here and then go across here. Sure enough, that's hopefully around 22.7 for uh, the test arm. And similarly here, around 4.4 for the, the control arm. So the LS means are created the exact same way. Now we're going to move into a scenario where we're going to look at time to event data. Um, so I'm looking at a basically a log rank test as well as understanding hazard ratios for an outcome that is uh, both, I'll say, ordinal as well as continuous. So here I'm going to consider an oncology trial with 200 subjects per treatment group. Uh, and let's consider the following five-year outcomes. And what you see here for five-year outcomes is that 61 or 30.5% survived to five years, and the control arm, 54 out of 200, uh, or 27 percent survived um, from, from the control arm. So 30.5 percent in the test, 27.0 in the control. The Pearson chi-square test statistic constructed the exact same way that we had done before shows a p-value of 0.4393. So taking a look at the five-year survival outcomes so um, for this trial, you're not able to show a difference between the test group and the control group. Um, the difference is small at two, sorry, at three and a half percent. So the difference in percentages is actually small and the p-value is large at 0.4393. So looking again at the five-year outcomes, um, just at five years, we're not showing a difference. So historically today, what I've done when the p-value hasn't been significant for a what I'll say, um, a straightforward test not adjusting for anything, I've adjusted for baseline. Um, and I've been able to reduce the p-value fairly significantly because I'm reducing the variability. However, here, I'm not going to be adjusting for baseline. Instead, I'm going to take into account the time of those deaths. And so what I'm looking at here is a fairly standard Kaplan-Meier survival curve. I'm including the fact that patients have died, and I'm also including the timing of those deaths. So I'm using more information in hopes of gaining more power to be able to show a significant difference. And so what one can see here on this figure is that, sure enough, 
the test arm survival curve is always higher than the control arm. And to understand a survival curve, what one wants to see here is that any time there's a drop in this curve, that means there's been a death. Um, so when there's a big drop, there's more than one death that occurs essentially at the same point in time. The actual symbols means there are censored observations. So there were uh, multiple subjects who were still alive at day, uh, essentially, sorry, this is weeks. So I forgot to state that. I'm showing the survival in weeks um, just to be able to have a, a nice, uh, if you would, a, a, a nice horizontal axis. So within five years, five times 52 is 260. So there are 260 total weeks within five years. So the vertical axis is just the proportion who is surviving at that given time. So if you go up, you know, basically right around at one year, you can see if I go up from one year, we have a little over 60% surviving, if you would, in the control arm and a little, possibly a little over or right on 80% surviving in the test arm. And the points that are to the far right here are those that are censored, and that just means those subjects were still alive at five years. I've constructed a study that there weren't any censors during uh, the visit, or uh, sorry, uh, in the middle of the five years. They either died during the five years or they were censored at the end of five years. And so a couple of statistics that one frequently sees out of uh, a survival analysis is median time to survival. And the way to do that is very similar, if you would, to you know how we constructed the LS means. However, here, what one would do is you look at the 50% survival, because that's the median, and you draw a horizontal line to the survival curve and then drop that line down vertically in order to determine the median survival time. So the median survival time was 67.1 for the control arm and 93.1 uh, weeks, and we're talking weeks here, so uh, uh, an additional 26 weeks or about an additional half year um, being on test versus control. And so that's a pretty meaningful difference as well um, when, when you're increasing a survival by another half year, especially when sur the median sur survival was only just over a year on the control arm. And so the log rank statistic is a statistic that is frequently used um, to test whether or not those survival curves are different. It as well is not testing the median. So it's really a lot like the Wilcoxon here. Um, it's not testing the median. It's testing that the overall curves are different. Um, its construction is actually very similar to the Pearson chi-square. And essentially at every event time or every time of death, you take the number of observed deaths at that time for, let's say, the test treat, or sorry, overall number of observed deaths. And from that, you calculate the expected number of deaths that would have occurred or should have occurred in the treatment arm and in the control arm, again, under the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis being that the, the curves are the same. So you would expect a similar number of deaths as long as the same number of purport, you know, proportionate to the number of people still alive in those two arms. You subtract it from the observed number of deaths, as you have here, and you come up with an overall statistic. And so this calculation is completed at each death time, and then the values are summed across all the death times. And I went through that pretty quickly because it's very similar to how the Pearson chi-square test statistic is constructed. The log rank chi-square test statistic is 5.011 and results in a p-value of 0 0.0252. And that is as compared to the p-value for just a straight Pearson chi-square looking only at five years. So I'm dropping a lot of data. I'm not looking at how the deaths occurred or the timing of the deaths. I'm only saying how many people are alive at five years. Whereas in the log rank, I'm interested in care about the timing of the deaths and those survival curves. And sure enough, with looking at the log rank, we're able to conclude there is a basically reject H naught and conclude that there is a difference in those survival curves. Now, a measure of the relative difference of the survival curves is given by the hazard ratio. And the hazard ratio for this data is 0.77. It can be approximated, um, and it can be approximated in certain cases better than others, but it can be approximated using the median survival times where I'm just basically dividing the median survival time of the control by the test in order to get the hazard ratio. And what the hazard ratio implies is that at any given point in time, 
the probability of a patient dying in the test arm is 0.77 times the probability of the person dying in the control arm. And so with that, it's basically just showing that, all right, there is a reduced chance of dying at any given point in time um, in the test arm versus the control arm. Okay, so thank you very much. I know I went a little over. I apologize for that. The key takeaways here um, for me really are statistical inference. We're not able to measure the entire population, but that's what we're trying to draw conclusions to. So what we need to do is we need to measure a sample. We treat and measure a sample, and through hypothesis testing, using test statistics and p-values, we draw inference to that population of interest. We looked at different summarizations and testing methodology depending on data type. So we looked at t-test, analysis of covariance, and Wilcoxon rank sum for continuous or ordinal data. One key thing here that we saw that looking at analysis of covariance, we're actually able to reduce variability, which gives us a better chance um, at demonstrating uh, a significant difference or a better chance at rejecting the null hypothesis. For binary, ordinal, or nominal data, we looked at the Pearson chi-square and logistic regression tests. Very similar, highly similar to the t-test and analysis of covariance, uh, only we're looking at binary data. We were able to see, again, that logistic regression adjusting for baseline. We were able to demonstrate a difference where we weren't in the Pearson chi-squared, and that's because we were able to really reduce the variability around the data through fitting that logistic regression adjusting for baseline. And then the log rank test, um, what you saw as well there, not taking into account the time or the path of survival. Um, we were not, and using just a straight Pearson chi-square test, we did not have something that showed significance with respect to survival uh, probability at five years, but taking into account time and looking at log rank test, we were able to demonstrate a statistically significant difference in favor of, of the test arm. So, uh, the key thing here, honestly, is reduction, ways to reduce variability in, in clinical trials, both from a, what I didn't discuss, but from the design stage, which can be a whole other hour of discussion, but then also from an analysis strategy stage uh, that will allow one to demonstrate a statistically significant difference using less patients and therefore saving sponsors a lot of money and, and getting products uh, to market faster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dale, and thank you to everybody who joined. This concludes our webinar. We unfortunately don't have time for Q&A. Thank you again for joining, and have a great rest of your day.